detailed questions where you can come and uh, see these guys that will be hanging out for a few minutes. But uh, do we have any questions? Over here. Yeah, I really appreciate all the work you guys have done on stability over the years with the 404 and the 808. It's, it's more rival than the old 404 was. But it introduces a question in my mind, which is this. You read slow twitch, the rule is ride the deepest wheel you can. If it doesn't kill you, you'll be faster, right? Some people may have read that. But the trick is, wheels are getting so rideable, even when you get near the, the limits of stall, that it may not kill you, but how do you know you're still faster? Which leads to my question. Is there any interest or any drive on your side to come up with data on just what the stall angle is roughly of all these variable wheels? doesn't matter in mass start very much, but to some of us who do things like team ramp or time trials or triathlon out of the open cone or something like that. What do you guys uh, have to say on that subject? Okay, uh, who wants to answer that one? Please try to repeat the question if you can. <laughs> <laughs> I could. So. Uh, the, the problem, in, I think Jim hits on it, talking about chunk method is variables. And the, the key, where we start to struggle right now is, is for any one of you, the variables number in the dozens. Uh, you know, things that we, we didn't touch on here, we talked about trying to move the center of pressure relative to steering rate, or steering angle, and center of the center of pressure relative to the contact patch. Well, almost every bike you, you can find has some variation here in uh, steer tube angle, or head tube angle, contact patch, things such as uh, tire width will change the shape of the contact patch which changes the, essentially the, the leverage that the wind has relative to the steering axis and the contact patch, because that's your pivot point. So you, know, you start to get into this multivariable equation that literally has dozens and dozens of variables, and it makes it almost impossible to start generalizing. What Jim just talked about, the Chung method, is really the answer for, for you, the rider. You know, the one thing he didn't say that I'll say is, you know, for $900,000 an hour, you can go buy an hour of time at the wind tunnel. You, you can buy, you can take that same money and put it towards a power meter and be your own virtual wind tunnel for many, many, many hours. And in there, you'll solve a lot of what Jordan hit on, which is that faster is faster. And so maybe for you and your position and where you ride, the wind conditions of that time, uh, your steering angle, your tires, all of those variables are now fixed because it's yours. It, you can determine what's faster for you. And I think that's, that's for me, what's really exciting about some of these software developments is, you know, you will soon have the ability to determine what's, what's faster. And as Jordan says, that at the end of the day is what's faster. And so, you know, we're going really from a point of really broad generalizations, right? The deepest thing that you're comfortable writing, that, that was completely true three years ago. And we all believe that to be true for you. Um, you know, within that, we've always said, hey, if you're, if you're scared, you're not going to go fast, right? If I tell you to ride a 1080 and it scares you to death and you spend your entire event thinking about how regretful you are that you chose this wheel, you're not going to have a very good event, regardless of what that event is. Um, but the stuff Jim really hit on is, is empowering our customers and all of us to learn what is faster for us in our condition without having to make these these broad generalizations that really are probably more often wrong than right. Josh, thank you very much. Question right here in the front row. Uh, it's for Josh. Um, you talked about vortex the shedding, and you talk, talked about the antenna. So speed wall, which is the wind, well, you can do that. Yeah, this is a good one. It, it, interesting, and we didn't touch on it here, but um, speed wall is a harmonic effect that's really driven by vibration. Uh, induced mostly from, from the ground up through the system, and where you have a, the, the vibrations coming in are near the natural frequency of the system. It's largely the natural frequency of the system is dominated by top tube stiffness and mass. Um, natural frequency of speed wobble is around two hertz. And one of the things we actually cover in one of our papers is that wheels that tend to be incredibly difficult to handle have natural frequencies down near two hertz. Um, there's a great paper on this written years ago where you know, you're more likely to speed wobble in the cold. And that links to a great paper um, from a Harvard Medical Journal where they point that the natural frequency of human shivering is two hertz, plus or minus a few percent. <laughs> I mean, th there's some really crazy interaction here, and it's one of these things that you know, we find, you know, OK, 
okay, these are our wheels that nobody likes to ride, and you know, damned if the, the natural frequency, the, the Stroll number is what, what we use to define it, natural frequency sits in that one to two hertz range. Wheels that tend to be easy to handle, um, we're up in the six, seven hertz range. Uh, it's in some of the papers, we've got copies here, but the uh, old 404 was around five hertz natural frequency, new 404 is north of 12. New 303 is around 15, I and mean, we've been able to push these natural frequencies, and hence the amplitudes, much, much, much higher. And, and that guarantees that your natural frequency of the wheel is far away from the natural frequency of, uh, of a phenomenon like speed. Oh. Uh, we have another question. Sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I have a question about uh, the effect of turning uh, and overcoming uh, gyroscopic stability of a, of a wheel. So say you have a uh, wheel with a, with a larger uh, rotational mass, deeper section versus uh, uh, a lighter aluminum rim. The one has got more aerodynamic, but also a larger uh, rotational uh, mass, more gyroscopic stability, which you have to overcome when you turn. Does that, does that have any effect on uh, maybe the choice of, uh, of a wheel, or did you, have you factored this into your thinking at all? Uh, maybe for a criterion, for example, with more turning, um, a lighter rim, which is a little bit less aerodynamic, might be favorable to one that you would use in a time trial where you're going pretty straight. Uh, Jordan's going to take that question. Yeah, I think that in terms of the practical effect, it actually works out to be largely the opposite of what you might think. That you actually want those heavier wheels, and I, I helped a, a, she was a, a light woman who was really nervous about riding deep section wheels in it, at the race in Hawaii. And most of the time when you turn, it, you, there's really a large part of it, you know, where you're actually leaning. So it's, you're leaning and turning. And so, I mean, turning a bike is not just sort of, oh, I'm turning. But where it brings up the larger point, which is that these deeper wheels, because they're heavier and they have a more gyroscopic effect, they're actually more stable. And it's actually the other thing is that the faster you ride, the more stable you are. And so this woman was saying, you know, on these big descents, like say from Javi, you're going really fast and you want to come out of the arrow bars because you think that, you know, you're nervous. And what I said is, the faster you ride, because, and on deeper wheels, you're gonna have more stability when you're going faster because the wheels want to stay upright. And I think that that's the sort of thing where rather than saying that these wheels are harder to turn, it's actually that the wheels actually provide stability, you know, in terms of, you know, winds hitting you and being able to stay down in the arrow bars. You can actually rely on the mass of the wheel. And then, especially when you start to think of things like uh, the fire by shape and you know, moving that pressure center that you can actually say that these wheels are going to make it so that I can ride faster, which is going to make me more stable so that I can ride faster, which makes me more stable. And all of a sudden these things start building on each other. And so at the end of the day, these deeper wheels are making you faster because, not just because of the stability, but because they actually make you faster, which makes you sort of everything compounds and you end up with a much greater overall net effect than you might if you just sort of said, well, I'm looking at this one variable. And so I would say that the answer is sort of that it, I would say it's actually a non-issue and that really the counter is true that you can feel confident riding these deeper wheels because of the stability issues you can ride them faster and then that will make you even more stable. Uh, by the way, Jordan studied aerospace and engineering in Princeton, so he's got a sense of that answer. Uh, anyway, I, I think we're at 1130 right now. Is, is there one more question we can take? One more question right here in the front row. Talking about how the, the shapes of wheels change everything is the difference between a 700 and a 650 wheel going to make, make a difference in things like the, the shedding frequency or are we looking at in the future different sizes of those wheels, maybe having conversion design? Who wants it? Josh? Go yes. <laughs> All right. Everyone, hey, I want to thank you guys for taking time to, to, to come to this, this seminar. Uh, you. I think you can get a sense for our enthusiasm and the fact that these gentlemen want to educate you as well as, you, as, as well as they possibly can. Please stop by our booth if you want to, you know, get some time with them, drop off your cards at our front desk if they're not there, but ask for them by name. Again, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Gentlemen, thank you very much. <laughs>